Welcome, everyone. My name is Monica Powell. I'm the CMO at Aerospike. We're very, very happy to have all of you here today. This is our first meetup after we open sourced our technology just a couple weeks ago. So very excited about that. Uh, very excited to see what you guys will create out of um, uh, uh, using Aerospike. And today we're very happy to welcome uh, John Kristenak of AppLovin. He's going to talk a little bit, tell us a little bit about AppLovin, and I hear that they've grown like crazy in this last year. So he's going to talk about um, how he scaled his technology. And then also want to introduce Sukant Ganguly there. Uh, he's joining Aerospike as our VP of Solutions Architecture. And so I'm going to let Sukant then, you know, pepper questions uh, at John, as well as all of you. You know, let's make this an interactive discussion so that we can all uh, learn from John and uh, hear about his exciting story. Is that good? We operate with that? Let's just test. Good. OK, so this is about what it takes to build an infrastructure that can handle billions of requests a day. How many people here have an infrastructure that can handle billions of requests a day? Haven't tried it? Haven't tried it? OK. So what it involves and what I'm going to talk about is a process for deciding what you put into your infrastructure, how you manage it, and how you make changes to it. And that's basically what the talk is going to be about. And then after I do that, we can talk about questions and things. So I'm going to talk about the various components and how we decided on those. First, I'll tell you, what is AppLovin? Why do we have to handle 15 billion ad requests a day? It's a mobile ad platform for brands who want to acquire new customers and engage, re-engage existing customers. So on questions, I've been asked if people could hold questions until the end, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. You have a quick question, or you're just waving hi? Yes? Where is the inspiration for your company's name? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was on a panel about a year ago at, um, at Aerospike in Trulia in San Francisco, and someone asked me that same question. So that answer's on YouTube, actually, but it's actually not the right answer. Um, so I'm actually going to wait for on that question as well, because uh, I don't want to mess that one up again. So anyways, we're, uh, we're a mobile ad platform. And mobile is, of course, a huge business that generates all this request. The ad business in general is structured like a giant automated marketplace these days. So who knows what an RTB is? It's a real-time, good, real-time bidding. That's where supply for a ton of ads exists on the internet. And it exists for both people that buy on web and people that buy on mobile. And those are the guys that generate 100 billion possible ad requests on the web, maybe 500 billion possible ad requests a day that people can bid on in an auction model and buy. And so we handle the mobile portion of that. We see almost all of the mobile inventory in the world. We see almost all the users in the major markets and the mobile inventory in the world. And that's why we needed an infrastructure that can handle this kind of load. If you think about 15 billion requests a day, I actually haven't done the math lately, but I'm thinking it can peak out about three or 400,000 requests a second, something like that. OK, so the question is, where are we in the RTB equation? We work with advertisers and publishers. We have an ad network of publishers. We provide advertisements into their apps, so on mobile apps mainly. And we also buy advertising impressions from um, RTBs, and we put the advertisers' ads in those impressions. So so we're more like a DSP, a form of DSP, right? Uh, we don't say we're a DSP, we're not, but that's what our platform does. So when you think about what you need to do this type of thing, um, actually, we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about scale. You know, what is scaling? There's all sorts of different kinds of meanings of the word scaling, and it's really important to us. And I'm going to talk about scaling from an MBA point of view which is someone from the business side comes to me and says, Why do we, what's scale out mean? What's important? How do I scale? Why do we always talk about scalability, John? And I'm going to say, well, the answer is, this is the history of app loving's traffic. The blue line is how many requests we've been handling. The red line is how many servers. The blue line is in billions. The other numbers are in regular digits. The red line is how many servers do you, hand, do you need to handle that load. And the bottom line that looks flat is, goes from about three to 15 to about 24. And that's the number of people. 
So for us, what scaling means for the business is being able to handle a massive increase in load without necessarily linear increase in hardware or people. It wouldn't, be, wouldn't really help for us if we, in a month, had to scale to 30 billion ad impressions a day, but we needed twice the number of servers or twice the number of people. So we do sublinear scaling on those things. In fact, and, and I'll talk about this, through our infrastructure getting more efficient, we actually have reduced the number of servers we need to handle 20 times the load of impressions in the last year. Does that make sense? Okay. So what do you need to be able to build this type of infrastructure? Um, you need to build it out of custom components. There's no on the, sh you know, there's no on the shelf, off the shelf type system where you can say, ah, I just want to run hundreds of billions of ad requests through this thing. You need to decide what you're doing, whether it's the telco business or the ad business or high frequency trading or profiles for users in, in a, in a customer-centric business, and you're going to have to build a distributed system out of carefully selected components. And over time, every time there's a major change in your traffic, those components are going to change as well. And what, it, you know, what kind of carefully curated components do we need? I'm going to run through kind of the pieces. Um, we need the components that, for us, when we founded the company, we said, you know, so many ad tech companies come up with one great idea and they build that, and they sell that, and they build a giant sales force around that. And they're essentially a very successful one-trick pony. And we didn't think the mobile marketplace would put up with that for very long, because the way that advertising worked in the mobile world was going to change pretty quickly from 2011 to 12 to 13 till now. So we wanted to build a very flexible infrastructure. We wanted to build pieces that would allow us to innovate no matter what the market needed. For example, if we needed to do retargeting, we want to build that on top of an infrastructure and not have to reinvent a whole infrastructure to do retargeting. And we were able to do that. So here quickly are the pieces of what our infrastructure really do. At the front side of it are a lot of web servers. And that's where the majority of the hundreds of computers are looking at. So these guys are answering the billions of requests a day. And each request comes in. We have to make a decision whether we want to bid on this impression, how much we want to pay for it, and what ad we should serve. And we have to make that decision in about 50 milliseconds. So that's where you're getting some serious load on these machines and you have to be very efficient. And that's where you'll see the other pieces come into play. Any system these days is going to have a very serious amount of cash associated with it. And so I'll talk about kind of the components that we use for caching. But what we want to cache is the user profile information for several billion users who have a mobile phone. And that needs to be available in that very small period of time for those web servers to answer out what kind of profile data you can use to decide whether you want to bid on these advertisements. And then what to show them if you do bid on it and win. So databases, you know, these layers kind of blend together. There's a lot of things you can think of as a database, and I'll talk about the different parts of databases that we actually deal with. But what's important for us is there's the real-time caching layer where you immediately need to serve out all these requests. And then beyond that, there's a much richer set of analytics and reporting and data warehousing and data science that need to be able to access different types of databases. And these could be SQL databases or no SQL databases. They could be you know, distributed. We want them to be clusterizable. Those are, those are the types of things we need. So, so far you have a web server layer, a caching layer, and then beyond that you have databases where all your base information is really stored. So this next component that is important to an infrastructure, and I kind of, you know, I hope people kind of understand what this is, it's distributed messaging or pub-sub messaging services. And this is a way that I can take information from anywhere that comes into me. Log files that are rolling in when I'm dealing with hundreds of thousands of requests a second. Monitoring information from my web servers if they're telling me something's down. And I can put it into a queue and have it arrive at any of the places where I need it to be. So you can think of, I have a lot of sources of information. I have to get it through this queuing system. And I have to be able to distribute it out to anywhere basically in the world. 
So that could be the Vertica database, or it could be a MySQL database, or it could be a Hadoop system, or it could be a storm real-time processing system. So distributed messaging um, is actually a pretty key portion of any architecture, and I'll talk about how that fits together in a little bit with one slide that kind of shows the whole picture. Finally, we need distributed computation. So at App11, we have data centers in at least seven locations across the world right now. Um, what that means, and when you generate 10 terabytes of data a day or you have all this data flowing through, is that if I want to find something or I want to operate on some data, I don't really know where that data might need to be. I need to be, and I also know that it's probably a large search problem to find, you know, if I'm looking for a given advertiser's behavior for the day. Someone says, what happened? Well, I need to be able to process that across all the data centers that I have, and I need to be able to do it in some kind of time, which is reasonable. It's so it's so much data that just reading it is going to take a lot of time. So you have to have distributed computation. That means something like Hadoop. Um, you know, something that is a parallel processing system that sees all your data, which is enabled by this log structured architecture, and can operate on it quickly. <laughs> what is our cluster management system? His name's Omer, he's sitting over there. <laughs> um, so, so from, a, from a computation, from a computation point of view, you know, we've used Hadoop in the past, and we haven't used it at the level of having some of the advanced cluster management that people are now starting to um, do. We're actually moving more towards Spark right now. No, we, we no. right, you can't do auto scaling. So it's not just the human being, it's the knowledge of what, so here's the thing about cluster management for Hadoop or Spark or any kind of parallel computing environment. Most of it is very difficult to deal with at first. Hadoop has been around for nine years or more and is just starting to see kind of sophisticated cluster management software. So 15 billion. The question is, does 15 billion requests per day mean a lot of requests or a lot of computation? Um, both. So wh why don't we also kind of move this to the end of the conversation? because I can have some members of my team talk about what we do. What I, my main point was, and it's going to be a point that I'll bring up in the main purpose of, this con of what I'm talking about, is these components that you choose. You know, if you chose Hadoop five years ago and you started using it, you're a pioneer, and there's not many other choices, and you're going to say, oh, what's your cluster management system for Hadoop? Well, there really isn't a good one. Now, there are a few good ones. Cloudera and people, you know, there's Tez and there's D Yarn have generated the second level of tools on top of these distributed computing environments. So you have more options now, but honestly, for most of the things we deal with, whether it's databases or networking or the caching layer, at our scale, most of the time, we started out with a solution that's pretty incomplete. And I'll show you a chart that kind of talks about that a little bit. So this is, this is a overall picture of what the generic architecture of our system looks like. It's called a log-based architecture. There's a guy named Jay Kreps at LinkedIn who's written about this extensively, and they've built you know, tools around this, and they've open-sourced a lot of them. One of them is called Kafka, um, which helps do this. But the fundamental idea here is you have a bunch of sources, and I kind of talked about this, and you have log files as the transactional unit coming out of all these sources. So if you're an ad server, you're logging, did I serve an ad? Did I bid on an ad? Did I see a click? Did I see an impression? What happened? And you're spitting that log out and it gets you know, big and everyone, you dump out chunks of logs into your queuing, your message system, and they go somewhere. And they get processed and they get written into databases. And the key thing that really makes this an innovation kind of architecture is that you don't really know what you might want to plug into that system. You might want to plug in Spark. You might want to plug in Vertica. You might need to plug in Aerospike in certain places. But you need to be able to get all that information that comes in out to any of those different tools. And so the, the key architectural concept or paradigm that we used is this. And we would started doing this before, obviously, Jay wrote this paper about a log-based um, arch architecture. But a lot of other ad technology companies do something similar. And a lot of other data flow management you know, businesses have to do something like this. This has now been codified, and I think you'll see it be 
kind of the dominant paradigm in large scale processing um, for the next five or ten years. So this is how we do it and it enables us to hook up all our sources of data through logs and it says centralized. It says take the, all the organization's data and put it into a central log for real time subscription. Of course it's distributed really. It's not just going to be in one place. For us it's distributed across multiple data centers. But you can think of it conceptually as a centralized logging system. All right, so, you know, I've talked about different components, whether it's Hadoop or you can think about databases, caches, Aerospike. When we faced a problem, what do we do? We had to look at what the available components were and think of, we had a process or a structure of how we evaluate whether this thing is worth putting into our system. Because it's an expensive proposition, whether it's an open source software or you have to pay people for the software. If you try something and it doesn't work, it sets you back for months. So what did we look at first? We looked at who's using it already. We looked at who are the proven use cases. In the case of Aerospike, a guy from Blue Kai came to me and said, oh, you know, we've used, Aer we've used Citrus Leaf, at Aeros uh, which was what Aerospike was called a couple years ago, at Blue Kai for a year and a half, and you've got to be using that. And so I actually talked to, I don't know, four or five customers at the time and got is their case like what I'm doing? What do they like about it? What don't they like about it? What works? When I would ask the question, when I put this in my shop, what's going to happen that's going to surprise me? And they'd tell me, and you know, you look at those kinds of answers. The other thing you look at is developer momentum, especially in any open source project or even a uh, commercial product. Are there drivers and developers who are writing about this, using this, documenting this? Is this product going to have kind of a trajectory that you really want to be on? And so the way you sense that is, you know, you can, you can see that in days like, you know, compare Storm to Spark right now. These are both real-time computation processing system. Which one has more developer momentum? You can probably measure that. So you might have your opinions about which one it is, but you want to know people in the, you, you'd like to have access to those people too. You'd like to say, oh yeah, I know someone who's using that system, and I, if it's an open source system, I have a way to have my issues addressed. Um, driver fit, it sounds kind of technical, but it means will this thing fit into my, our, you know, if we're using PHP or we're using Python or we're using C++, is this thing natively integrated with that language? Can I write tools that will actually access the APIs for this component? And now the kind of the more abstract portions of what you think about. To me, really important in the infrastructure is does this component simplify what we do? Will we be able to throw more usage cases into it than we thought of originally? Because if I can get rid of two other components that are unreliable or don't scale or something with this thing, great, I have fewer things to worry about. Does it simplify our world? Does it fail nicely? That's pretty self-explanatory, but of course most things, you know, it's very hard to get things to fail nicely, especially when you're under the constraints of across a lot of different data centers in a distri distributed world. Do, do you know when things are failing? Some products you don't really know if they're breaking. And those are kind of the most dangerous ones of all. And so the last thing is platform risk. And what is platform risk? It's are you committing a lot of resources to something that, you know, will cost you later on? So an example you might think of is um, maybe, you know, you're not a .NET shop, but this platform is actually basically a .NET platform. Is that something that you can buy into? If you were going to commit to Amazon Web Services or a Google Compute Engine, are they going to go the direction that you're going to want to be going in the next three years? Are they going to pull the rug out from you? Maybe they take away a service. Let's say you were doing some sentiment analysis company and you were depending on the Twitter fire hose. And a year and a half ago, Twitter decides, nope, you're not going to have that unless you're one of our few partners that we want to sell that to. So those are the types of things even as a business, you think, if we were to be acquired or um, someone was to look at our technology, would they look at this technology as an advantage or disadvantage? So you have to buy into, really, is this platform where we're going? And it's, I know this is probably the most abstract sound, sounding thing, but the platform's goals have to match your business's goals. Okay, so now I'm actually going to talk about our stack and how it has evolved over the past three years. And in general, and this isn't a perfect uh, picture of timeline, but you can see that we actually started building with PHP. And I 
been at other companies and we started writing ad servers in PHP. And people go, how could you write an ad server that handles billions of requests in PHP? The main reason we did it was because it was very fast to do so and it was pretty easy to find people who knew how to do that. You found developers who knew how to do PHP and PHP made everything easier. Same thing with MySQL. MongoDB at the time was probably one of the top NoSQL databases out there and that was an option that we looked at and we used. And of course as a startup, we built most of this stuff initially on Amazon Web Services. So in each phase here, we kind of had to start with what was out there that was we had developers who could deal with, that was fast early on, we want to get the product out, and that was easy. We used RabbitMQ for our pub sub messaging at the time. So over time, you know, you'll see some of these are databases, Cassandra, Airspike, Vertica. The two things I'll talk about here in the rest of the talk are kind of our transition from PHP to C++ <laughs> and our transition from, um, in, our, in our database choices. As you can see, one more thing is, you know, we actually used to use Amazon Web Services to do, but as we're going on, we're simplifying things. There's probably, Redis is something we use throughout the stack. MongoDB, we're just actually pretty much pairing out of our stack right now. Um, PHP is going away as well. So back here there was a lot of pieces. We tried a lot of things. I feel like I tried almost every NoSQL database at some point. Um, do you think so? Yeah, we did. <laughs> and and fact is most of them at the time were new and they basically didn't work very well. So we narrowed it down and we've pared it down um, to a few that we think we really understand and I have team members and people on, my, on the engineering group that really know how to deal with. So. So, of all these systems, when we decided to get rid of a system or change it, you know, why would we make a change? I mean, it's actually expensive to make a change. And what, what would you do? So these are the kind of six factors that we worried about the most when we were saying, oh, this system is now not working for us anymore. They're pretty straightforward. You know, <laughs> Does, does a system stay up? Is it available? Replication is probably my favorite choice, my favorite reason to get rid of a system. Because most things don't really work in the world of you have to replicate over a wide area network across the world from Hong Kong to Amsterdam across different data centers with limited amounts of bandwidth. There's the speed of light issue of how long it takes for stuff to move you know, between even LA and New York. Um, poor fault tolerance is a big problem many systems where, yeah, it might be able to deal with the fault tolerance, but like I said, can it be managed? Can you monitor it? Does it stay consistent while it's broken? Um, a big issue for us, and you're dealing with, ad, this is always true in ad, ad serving, is how much memory are you taking up? And why is that an issue? You know, we can go out and buy boxes with a terabyte of RAM in them right now. But at the time when you're working on, say, Amazon Web Services, you might have only been able to get a 64 gigabyte box. So the amount of memory that the system uses is really um, a thing. And I'll talk about even like RabbitMQ. One of the big reasons we had to get off RabbitMQ was the amount of memory it was consuming. Go ahead. Sure. What is our hardware infrastructure? We have a mix of colo and uh, some dedicated. Uh, I'm sorry, hosted and some colo. So most of it is hosted. Most of it is Linux boxes. Um, and then some of it is boxes we put together. We, like I said, we did run on Amazon. And what happens with Amazon is it's really appealing as a startup, but you run into, there's some performance issues with Amazon. It's not the fastest thing out there. You get a lot of variability in performance in terms of we're an ad serving company trying to respond to requests in under 50 milliseconds. Well, for sharing machines, that's very hard to do. Uh, you know, we even you know, looked at Google Compute Engine. I'm not gonna harp on Amazon. I was telling someone earlier, actually the biggest factor that kind of hurt us with Amazon early on as we started to spend a lot of money with Amazon was we, we were spending six figures a month with Amazon, but we still really had support via API. So the support was a problem. So all those things, um, I mean, you know, they're great when you say, I just need some servers, I want to scale up, I want to be doing things quickly. But it's really hard to sustain once you start to look at the cost structure and you start to get bigger and you start to have hundreds and thousands of inst instances. The answer to the second question is no. 
Uh, do we have any plan to adopt OpenStack? But how do we do capacity planning? So this whole talk is about how we do capacity planning. It's basically these bottom few things, where is if I can get machines where I have what I call scale out ability, where I can add machines and solve the problem, I'll give you an aerospiking is, a, is an example of that. You can add machines and it still works. Vertica, you can do that pretty well. Hadoop or HDFS, pretty well. That's the safest you know, story for capacity planning. Um, recently, we probably doubled our traffic in the course of a month. And how did we do that? I mean, my whole spiel is this infrastructure enables us to do that. We just either add more machines or get better components. So this next slide, uh, Brian Bolkowski, who's not here, CTO of Aerospike, he said, you know, let's be really fair here. Let's not, um, you know, favor one solution over the other. And I said, meh, I don't care what you say, Brian. Um, <laughs> this is what I call the hard knocks database rating system. And I hope you guys can see the colors. So this is a bunch of different databases which we've used or are using. There's Aerospike, MySQL, Memcached. One way or another, you think of these things as we store stuff. Vertica, MongoDB, Redis, RabbitMQ. In fact, on this list, I would say we're using, still using five or six of them. Okay? So it's not that it means you're a failure if you have some yellow or red on this list. Um, but given those six factors that I talked about, availability, replication, fault tolerance, memory usage, performance, and scale out, there's very few products that solve all of the problems, and none do. I mean, this is our experience of years of using these databases, um, and each one has you know, kind of a fatal flaw. And how you get around that flaw, like I said, everything above here, I'm happily using heavily right now. Here I'm trying to get rid of more, okay? But, you know, it's interesting. I mean, MongoDB, it does a lot of things pretty well. It also does them pretty averagely, but it's a pain overall. Um, so, you know, this is my real world rankings, and, you know, you can see that really on scale out, it means you're kind of, someone asked about capacity planning. To me, can I add more nodes? And adding more nodes is such a great feeling versus re-engineering something in your system. Very few systems allow you to really scale out very well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the question is, you know, capacity planning is useful when you care about close to optimal performance. So we're startup still. We're a 60-person company. We like to get close to optimal performance cost ratio. But for most of our business's purposes, we'd much rather stay running at any cost. So you have to really balance those things. Into the architecture that we built, I think, is what it really does is balances, let's be able to do stuff even if it's pretty expensive. Because we're in a market where we basically know how to make money, so we can afford to build out those kinds of things. So we're not in a kind of classic IT enterprise situation where you're trying to reduce costs and trade risk for money. You're trying to get rid of risk. We are more comfortable with the risk. So we move, you know, it's the classic old Facebook slogan of move, move fast and break things. But I want pieces that, you know, I can trust, right, that I can rely on. And what this, this table basically says is, you know, it takes a lot of time to build up that trust and to find the things, that, you know, there's more databases we've tried than are on this chart. Um, I'm going to talk about the two ways that we deal with, go ahead, ask a question. Uh, I see a lot of Is this the same yeah, we use Couchbase right now. <laughs> I'm going to go to the Brian Bolkowski thing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not on this chart, but if it was, it wouldn't be very high. So, um, you know, we do use Couchbase. We, it's more of a memcache-like layer for us. So it's kind of represented in that sense. Um, but what I want to talk about now is um, when we do a change. When do you make a change to, to your architecture? Given that you've said you've gone through trying to implement Cassandra and you've found all these problems, you know, why would you do change? We find there's two kind of cases. And Lauren, this is probably when I'm going to get ready to play the video. There's really a type one scenario, and there's a type two scenario. And I'm going to play this video that explains 
kind of what it's like after our team goes through a type 1 scenario when looking at a change to their system. Okay, so hopefully I can play the video here with my mouse. That escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? Yeah, I stabbed a man in the heart. I saw that. Brick killed a guy. Did you throw a trident? Yeah, there were horses and a man on fire, and I killed a guy with a trident. Brick, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. You should find yourself a safe house or a relative close by. Lay low for a while, because you're probably wanted for murder. So the point of that is that there's a lot of changes where all of a sudden something crazy happens. And, you know, the, the line is, let's see if I can get this line. <laughs> well, that escalated quickly, you know, and now you need to know what to do to respond to that. Um, and that's really the type one scenario. And maybe because we've gone through a few of those recently, we think that's kind of the dominant scenario. The nice thing about that scenario is if you do live through it, you come out with a better infrastructure at the end of it, and you've done something in a very compressed period of time. So you've replaced a whole database or your whole system with some other kind of system. You know, and it's pressure on your team. Everybody, there's a man on fire on a horse and trident's flying around. And you get somewhere very quickly. And I mean, I'll give you the example of, you know, we have a system for processing conversions. We have a database that manages that system. Now, all of a sudden, we have a new customer that's giving us a huge number of new conversions. That database is not keeping up with that system. Are we going to turn down the advertising revenue from that customer? No, we're going to tell some of these guys sitting in the audience here, let's replace that database this weekend. You know? Now, what's great about what we do with this kind of um, experience with all these other systems is that we, we probably don't have to go and test and acquire something new. We actually, for in that case, we actually pushed more work into Aerospike because we trusted it. So that's the kind of type one category. The, the type two category of changes is more like we had built our initial ad server in uh, PHP, like I said. And we knew for a long time that that's not really that efficient. It's easy to change. It's easy to program. A lot of people can program it. But it's just not nearly as fast as, say, a native C++ ad server. So over the, I don't know, we probably talked about it for a year. And we said, hey, we got to have a C++ ad server. And of course, at the same time, you're building more and more features into your existing legacy stuff. So at some point, you have to kind of bite the bullet and switch over. And my guideline for that would be, if you're going to do that, make sure you're getting a serious improvement, a 10x improvement. Don't just replace a system that's twice as good as the old system. So in this case, this is an early timing chart of a test um, C++ ad server. And the green lines are the times that it takes the PHP server to handle simultaneous requests in milliseconds. So somewhere in here, a realistic situation, it's up at 300 or 400 milliseconds, and the PHP, the C++ ad server, is down at 50, right? So we, we saw these tests, and we knew, yeah, this thing is going to enable us to do that earlier chart, which is instead of needing 5,000 servers at the end of the year 2014, if we go here, we're going to need a thousand or something like that. So that's a big improvement. And like I said, we knew it, but we had to live with the business reasons for keeping the PHP server for as long as possible. And we needed our team to step up, basically, and in kind of their extra time, build this C++ ad server and have it track parallel with the PHP one. And at some point, we seamlessly kind of switched them over. And you know, there's really... Um, there's, I guess what I'll really say about this, there's a lot of projects where you think, oh, we know we need to fix something. I like the idea of crash landing. Wait until this thing actually really needs to be fixed. Because engineering teams tend to want to gold plate stuff and rewrite stuff. And, you know, but when you're a startup, you don't get the luxury of doing that that much. So there are a few projects where you have to have those long-term projects going. Sure. So the question is, how do you manage to keep different things working in parallel in production? So we're kind of lucky in that when you have um, a large variety of requests coming at you, you have requests from our own ad network, which is of significant volume, and requests from you know, all the RTBs in the world, 
and you're not running at kind of optimal cost performance, you actually build parallel systems and you put them in place and you have a switch that says X percent is dedicated to system A or system B. And as an ad networking company, we are super used to the idea of the A-B test. So you're constantly trying to compare. Now there are some kinds of systems where it's really not easy to switch you know, in midstream. You're changing the engines on the jet as it's flying. But for most systems, you're going to do the same kind of, you know, turn the dial over slowly, compare results, run two systems of the same kind, do the standard deployment stuff of you have a dev environment, a staging environment, you know, and a prod environment. And you're going to build system B to whatever level of functionality that you can do, and you watch it, and you, you can actually send the same traffic to it as you're sending to the real system. And so then you can compare the outputs. And we don't always do that, but that's the ideal way to go. So this is actually the end of the prepared section of the talk. And uh, I think Sukhoff is going to take over and we can do some Q&A. And I'd also, I'll have a mic and I'll pass the mic to members of my team to answer certain questions. So why don't you moderate here? Great, great. Uh, thank you, John. This is fantastic. Uh, hearing about how you guys did, I'm app loving it. This is beautiful. Uh, this is, uh, uh, can, can we just get that slide up? I'm, I'm going to stay here so everybody can see it. That's a very interesting slide. I saw uh, whenever you make improvements, you're looking at 10x. Mm -hmm. uh, share with us a little bit about when you started looking at, I mean, you had a slew of databases out there yeah. that you use. I'm, I'm sure you you know, each one, yeah, when you started looking at it, you wanted you know, either start with something or improve you know, at that level. Where, where was Aerospike in that 10x measurement for you? What, what were the thoughts? How, how did you guys? Yeah, so, so here's the, the, you know, one of the kind of common initial reasons <laughs> for ad tech companies. Um, most ad tech companies on the web size use Aerospike for something called cookie matching. We didn't have cookie matching, but what we did have was the need to tie identifiers for users together. And, you know, I, can, I, I think we were looking for a distributed system that scaled. We had tried you know, using MySQL. We had tried using Cassandra. And we had a very hard time with, um, basically it's similar to the Amazon problem. The, the variability of performance in those things is so much, high, so much higher under load than when you're, say, testing. Meaning, you know, for Cassandra, we were happy to get 20 millisecond reads out of the thing. And the variability was 200 milliseconds, right? Wow. And those are well past our, so, when we looked at Aerospike, um, it, it was pretty funny. These guys, Gino and Srini and, and the sales engineers, actually, you know, since we're like two miles from here, we called them up one day and we said, we need this. And they came the next day to our office. Nice. And Srini, I don't know how you ever met, met him. He's the, one of the founders of Aerospike. He looks at our scenario and we're, we need like, I don't know, 30,000 reads a second and we need two terabytes of storage, and we want to be in under 20 milliseconds. And he's like, this is easy. No problem. And we're like, are you kidding me? You know, we, how can that be easy? And then we went through that process that I was talking about of, OK, tell us your customers. Who can we talk to? I think I you know, worked with Gino, and he gave me the names of different gaming companies and ad tech companies that were using it. And eventually, I kind of, oh, I'm believing that those guys are telling me the truth. I'm like, what doesn't work for you? And they all said replication. And at the time, I don't think replication was totally new. I think one of the customers, I think GSN or somebody, it was written for them or something. And um, so it's that process of, do I know this product? Can I find other people that are doing this already? Do I believe in the company? You know, It was great to have those guys show up and express tremendous confidence. And the other thing they had, which uh, is surprising, because I've talked to a lot of database vendors that don't necessarily have this, they had a spreadsheet. And you know, if this was my computer, it would still be on here. But, but it was a capacity planning spreadsheet. It said, if you do this volume, you need this many servers and this much memory and this much SSD. And then they had a guy like Brian who said, you know, don't buy those SSDs, buy these other SSDs over here. Because I think that's his actual favorite topic in the world to talk about. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so it gave us a lot of confidence and, and when we put it in, a, you know, we, we, it was kind of an emergency project. Uh, these guys right here, uh, Robert, you know, looked at it 
and we started kind of, they were actually kind of, Robert actually kind of liked Cassandra at the time. And uh, they started looking at it like, wow, this really does kind of behave like they're saying it does. So we moved to it pretty quickly because our goal was to be able to put a billion users into place and access any one of their records in, you know, a millisecond or two mill. Originally it was 20 milliseconds, but Aerospike came and, oh, we can do it in two milliseconds. And we pretty much do to this day. So that's, that's one of the Aerospike right. stories. Great. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to ask all the questions, so I would want you guys to ask questions. So yes. So, have you ever tried a pure in-memory solution instead of uh, SSD? Yeah, solution? so uh, um, I believe actually in in-memory solution. I, I think that in-memory solution is the way things will go. Um, now, how many things really work great with an in-memory solution right now? There's a couple things out there, you know, there's Druid and that's got SSDs behind it now and you can use Aerospike in the in-memory mode. Um, it's not that I don't care about cost, by the way. It's just that business innovation speed and market response time is probably more important. So that, like I said, when they had a capacity planning worksheet, that was very helpful to me. But what my main gist of the speech is, is that I'm going to build an architecture that can deal with anything that we might see by basically relying on these trusted components and scaling out and handling things faster and faster. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm always interested in putting more stuff in memory. Definitely is good. But uh, you know, there are other solutions like uh, Spark, uh, SAP, HANA, yeah. and Oracle gonna come up with an in-memory solution soon, you know, yeah. in a couple of months. You know. I probably won't be buying any Oracle stuff. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but Spark is something that we have invested heavily in. And we're actually right now building out our cluster in, in a data center. Um, and so, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll look at everything. I feel like we'll look at it, you know, we just, anything interesting out there that we see as proof and has momentum, we'll try. Hi, uh, you've put a lot of emphasis on uh, the log-based architecture, and you said you were moving away from RabbitMQ, so just by curiosity, what is your Q system now? Uh, actually, why don't I let Robert answer that, because he built our Q system, and he can tell you why we did that versus, say, look at Kafka and other things. So, I mean, yeah, we actually built our own queuing system. We originally used RabbitMQ, and we had to dump that due to memory constraints and the way that it handled the fault tolerance, and typically we would just end up losing the entire queue backup. Um, eventually, before I actually became part of the platform team, uh, my coworker Basel actually built out a primitive version of a queuing system that did the uh, basics of what we needed. At the time, Kafka was like kind of just starting out. And at a point, we investigated switching over to Kafka. But basically, the biggest constraint with Kafka that we didn't like is that you could only either get every message more than once or at most once. And you couldn't guarantee that things will be reliably delivered every single time exactly one time. And that was the primary reason why we built our own system, that and the fact that we already had a partial homegrown system in place, and it was obviously a lot easier to integrate that with our own code to go forward. There was a question here. Yeah, I was just curious whether you can go back to that uh, component slides you have and uh, tell us, like, uh, What's the reason you're moving from, like, which one replaced wh which, and uh, what's the reason you sort of uh, made those decisions? No, the one before that, that uh, timeline. Uh, timeline, yeah. 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 So you want a little more color on what we're doing here. Yeah, so. um, you know, for example, uh, Redis was like a godsend when it, when it, you know, kind of first was one of the choices. So Redis is lacking in terms of replication. So what else can you do? To, what one thing Redis is very good at, of course, is everything in memory, right? So what else can you do? So Aerospike took over some of the Redis functions. That's one area. For MySQL, um, we were using big MySQL servers. We were using a cluster of pretty four pretty burly machines to do all our reporting and analytics. We did something pretty radical, which is we looked at Vertica, and because of the scale out, and because Vertica is a columnar database, 
that actually supports a full version of SQL, um, we said, let's run most of our system on, try running most of our system on Vertica. So not just as a warehouse, but as kind of a database. Not so much a transactional SQL database, but a SQL queryable database that, for example, backs up most of our user interface functions. So when we saw that as a possibility to kind of unify, I talked about earlier, does it simplify our world? Now, I don't know if doing that actually simplified our world because it was actually getting a dog to stand on its hind legs to do as much as we got Vertica to do. But it allowed us to move away from this MySQL problem of how do you synchronize data across multiple data centers across the United States and the world you know, without replication being that easy to deal with in MySQL. So Vertica was an example of taking over here. Languages I talked about, we moved from PHP to C++. Um, new things that came along, you know, like we used to move all our data in different formats in JSON or in, you know, binary format or some, whatever we, so we ended up choosing Thrift probably because at the time there was some, I don't know, why did we, why did we start with Thrift? <laughs> okay. No. So first in Thrift to give the definition of the object and then since we operated systems written in different language, one of the things that we're really, really afraid that you know, somewhere where we start marshalling or unmarshalling the object in a different um, system, you know, there would be a bug, an integer would turn into a byte, a byte would turn into a boolean, a character is going to turn into an object. So Thrift actually solved that problem for us because, um, you know, this type of solution basically auto-generates code for you, so it's not possible to create a major issue. Now, it has its own drawbacks, which we're discovering now, but at the time it was a lot smaller than JSON, a lot more readable than like a comma separated or a custom binary value, and a lot easier to integrate because of the cross-language compilation. Yeah, just curious, like, uh, have you compared that with Avro? Like, why, why are you picking, you know, Thrift? Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we looked at Thrift and Avro, and actually now if you, you know, after we've been a year about with Thrift and you ask me if, if I should compare again, I'd probably be a lot more thorough in the comparison. So every had its benefits. At the moment, it didn't seem like it had as much developer momentum back when we were looking at it. Now the momentum is picking up and the streaming ability of Avro is certainly a very big plus that Thrift doesn't have that we have to kind of fake it and build it in ourselves so that we can have like streaming Thrift um, object uh, log, right? So uh, I think that back in the day, it seemed like a more stable, a better supported solution with developer momentum with people who are actually using it for somewhat similar purposes. So that was the motivation behind the initial decision. Yeah, so the question is, what's the problem with Thrift? So there are a couple interesting things about it. First, it's actually pretty good. So second, um, there were, we had some minor issues with actually cross-compilation with how it deals with some integers. Like for example, it doesn't do integers with 64 bits very well cross-platform, but those problems are solvable. One of the things that I think I dislike the most is it's not possible to stream a huge Thrift object. So in order to deserialize the Thrift object, and I hope I'm not too technical, <laughs> uh, well, in order to do that, you need to read the whole object in memory, then magic happens, and you can access the data. So that, I think, to me, is the biggest problem with it, and I didn't think it was a, such a big a problem back in the day, but now I'd probably try to do something where you can actually read object and deserialize object as you go, instead of having to keep the whole thing. But can I make one comment on, on thrift and data formats? I mean, we, we had a slide when we were talking about doing this presentation, and that's Basel, he's director of engineering for us. And he was like, you know, one really important decision that you try to make is what you do with your data and how you store it and what formats it's in. And we've made mistakes doing that. And, of course, when you make mistakes with terabytes of data or hundreds of terabytes of data or a petabyte of data, you don't unfold from them easily. You know, if you're sending a protocol around the world to all your servers and you wanted to change it, it'd be a pretty big job. So it's one of those kind of known things. You're going to choose one of these formats. We could have chose protocol bu buffers or Avro or Thrift or kept doing what we're doing. Um, and all of them are going to have a downside. And that's, that was kind of that point of that database chart. You know, you've got to live with some of these problems. And you can't just say, oh, there's a new perfect thing coming on because it, it won't work actually for you. So, but I would say that if you do decide to architect a giant system like this, 
you know, your data format stuff is actually one of the biggest fundamental issues you can make decisions on. So uh, moving a little bit away from the focus on the database side, you mentioned you use data science in your product. Uh, can you describe a little bit how you're using data science currently? Yeah, we like sprinkle it on and we hammer it <laughs> in. And then, um, so is what is data science, right? Um, data science to me is making kind of mathematical algorithms about how you're going to deal with your big data. So prediction, statistics, um, from an analytical point of view, can you do machine learning? Can you make observations about what's going on in the stream of data that actually add value to the business? So I think all ad tech companies are now looking at doing that because if you could predict who's going to do what or what ad they're going to like, one simple thing, and I didn't talk much about our product, but if you are on a mobile phone and you visit a hotels.com but you don't book a hotel, one of our products will show you ads for that hotel or recommended hotels like it. So we try to predict when you're likely to book and what product you'd like to book. If you're looking at sofas, maybe you need to buy a painting as well or a rug or something like that. So data science for advertising is about predicting human behavior to make the ads more relevant. And you know, this talk is about the infrastructure that enables that and the two kind of key takeaways are we allow all our data to go multiple places so the data scientists can have access to it for the long term and that the daily, you know, ad serving decisions can do operations on it in separate systems. Um, and the other thing, the other main thing for data science is, you know, you need to have some kind of predictive capability to be able to compete in this, you know, marketplace. Uh, a couple questions about Re Redis on your slide. First of all, are you still using it or you completely replaced it with Aerospike? This is one. And second, uh, one thing in common I see between Redis and Aerospike is Lua scripting. Are you using any of it? Have you used it? What do you think about it? How does it work with uh, trying to do complex things, transactional yeah. things? So on the first question, no, uh, R Redis is still part of our system. Um, we still use it and it's still very valuable in certain areas, right? It tends to be, you know, less of, a, it's not a clusterable solution that much, right? So it's used kind of in units at the server level. Um, the second part of the question, do we use Lua scripting in either Aerospike or Redis? And the answer is no. Um, we're actually, I mean, for all my talks about how we move and everything, we're pretty conservative. We're not using Aerospike 3 features right now, where I think we might have, do we have any Aerospike 3 in test? No. Do we have, you know, any MySQL 5.6 in test? No. But, you know, I actually, when Aerospike 3 comes out, I'm like, oh, look at this. You know, there's some cool features in here. We could do things. What I think I really look at is where would be the most appropriate place to do it? Since I can do it in any of these places, if I need to do some you know, vector manipulation or something in Aerospike, maybe I should be doing that in Spark because I'm really using Aerospike for its read-write memory performance and its speed. If I was to do anything that would risk that, that would be a pain. Maybe there's a better place to do that. There are a bunch of Lua scripts in Redis and this actually solved a big problem of doing some changes to the data in a relatively atomic manner. So from the client side, we just say, do this, and script does a whole bunch of things, and it's a one operation. Yeah, so, so I was just curious if you looked at anything I, like I this. I mean, you know, my, my engineers pretty much tell me to shut up when I come up with ideas about doing things like that. <laughs> so let's just work on solving the problems we have and not creating new ones. I, I, I absolutely agree. There's cool ways to use those things. But we tend to, you know, put cool features in the refrigerator. I wouldn't call it cool. I would call it. I would call it practical. It sure. really solves the problem sure. of not having to yeah. do this I, elsewhere. I, there's been times when we've been tempted. Yeah, I think you know the beauty of Aerospike solution is good performance, uh, uh, performance cost ratio, because uh, lots of companies they cannot afford a very expensive in-memory solution. But anyway. My question is similar to that gentleman. I'm not, I'm not sure you are willing to, ask, uh, to answer or not. You know, you are in real-time RTB, real-time bidding uh, 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 space, right? What kind of innovation you have in R RTB algorithm? 
<laughs> What's the innovation that we have in RTB algorithms? I, I mean, there's, there's a few key innovations. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it kind of talking about the architecture. One is we're one of the few places in mobile space that sees all the inventory. That, ha that helps us. Two is we have the magic sprinkled data science that does make optimization decisions, bidding decisions that we believe are better. And our third magic kind of RTB thing is our business side that actually works closely, product and engineering, that understands what our system can do so that they can make better decisions about, you know, what is the vector that matters in the RTB bidding world. It actually changes a lot. Um, I have to say, the first thing I said sounds kind of trivial, but keeping the RTB bidding flowing from across eight or nine different RTB systems, they all, most of them support the same protocol, some don't. The biggest guys in the world have a different protocol than the second biggest guys in the world, is actually a pretty number one, it requires a good infrastructure and a lot of work, and that is the building block on which you can do the smarter things, which are fundamentally optimization and prediction. Uh, there's a guy named Kurt Monash that um, does database industry analysis. And he's got like a rule, two rules, I believe. I don't have them on a slide or anything. I'm going to have to paraphrase. But rule number one is it takes tens of millions of dollars and five to seven years to create a really solid database system. And rule number two is you are not an exception to rule number one. <laughs> so, <laughs> same second. So, uh, you know, that's what I, 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 I know this slide is probably, you know, could, could get me in trouble eventually, right, if anybody, but I'm telling you, we use all these systems, right, and they, they, I'm just give, that's why it's called hard knocks, you know, I'm grading hard, okay, it's not like uh, they don't work, but each one has a very hard, you know, an area where it's weaker. You're saying, I, I guess there's another dimension on this chart, right, which is the use case dimension. So not everything is comparable to everybody. Right, and, and you know, it, 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 I didn't want to put my company name on this slide, <laughs> but <laughs> I, it, that's, it's for us, right? It's our interpretation of how the things use it for us. I mean, this is one of my big, one of my favorite things about AppLovin and our load that we deal with. And we're not, you know, like uh, other customers for Aerospike see 100, million re 100 billion requests a day. You know, they do different things, but they do this. Um, you know, you read high scalability and you read a case study, of, you know, even pretty big companies. We're dealing with requests at the level close to Twitter here. So when you, you know, you see a company that's basically a transactional oriented website or something where they're like, we had 15 million users in May, you know, and you're like, okay, well, that's an entirely different world of problems than you're dealing with here. The same thing, and I have friends that are working in this industry, you know, and I'm, you know, they say, yeah, we're doing algorithms for H HFT for high frequency trading, and we have uh, you know, 15 microseconds to do this calculation. I'm like, how do you do anything? If I don't know. You know. I don't know how you do anything in that a period of time. Right? But they do. They run their business based on that. So yes, this chart applies to kind of our business. Also, the question is, do you get uh, paid by conversion, or is that a based on volume uh, in your model? <laughs> Both. Um, <laughs> we make more money when we do more volume, yeah. So um, our model does do all different types of payment. We do do CPA, CPM, CPI, PPC. So we will do all different types of advertising payment. There are certain dominant fa factors, and we are very conversion-oriented, but um, mostly we get paid when success happens for the advertiser. Um, sorry. I think I have the token. <laughs> um, so just uh, to go back to the data format stuff, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about how you manage uh, schema evolution in regards to, well, I believe Thrift, for example, supports trivial stuff like adding fields, renaming fields, maybe even like type promotion or whatever. But how do you deal with it uh, from the point of view of your custom queuing system and aerial spike and or whatever else you want to comment on. I mean, if you, I'll, I'll let Basil handle it. It's pretty technical, but mostly it's, you know, we add things. But maybe Basil can add more. Well, yeah, so two questions, aerial spike and, yeah, and uh, database. So in terms of 
sorry, uh, AirSpike and messaging systems. In terms of messaging system, the way we built it is actually agnostic of the format that travels inside the message. So, you know, if we choose to go from, I don't know, Thrift to Avro tomorrow, none of the messaging component system are going to change because, you know, it's just a container that's, you know, shipped over from, you know, place one to place two. Um, in terms of uh, database, you know, this is a little trickier. So when we store something in AirSpike as a Thrift object, obviously we would be indeed limited by uh, update, capabili update capabilities of Thrift. So that's the indeed problem. However, so far, most of the changes that we had were additive. So it was never, uh, it was actually never like a big problem where we had to do something significant to uh, migrate. So uh, the question is, do we deal with mixed streams of different versions of the schemas? So since, you know, we use mostly Thrift actually for all of the streams, and since it's backwards compatible, it's actually very nice because, you know, some uh, components can send a newer version of the object and all, uh, you know, like the producer and the consumer can still read it fine. It just doesn't get, you know, to experience the new fields. So that worked very fine for us. So this additive model is actually what helped us a lot to be able to scale and deploy new features rapidly. Look uh, uh, to your next level of scaling. What, where do you see the, the pain point or the, the next thing to change? Yeah, there's a few things. So for the next level of, you know, say you want to go 10 times bigger than this, so we want to handle 150 billion requests a day. Most of the, you know, somebody brought up in-memory data databases. There would be more of that, I believe. At a very base level, there would be more of our own hardware. So we would have bigger boxes with more memory, more disk, things like that. Rather than being in a hosted environment, we might go more colo. So those are some things. Now, predicting which databases will work at the next level. Um, you know, like I said, there's other Aerospike customers that are working at bigger levels than us. So there's things like that. Vertica, same thing, you know, places that have hundreds of terabytes of Vertica and have 500 node systems. So that's one reason we bought into those systems, because we knew there were customers doing it at the, you know, 10 times level. Um, I, I would have to say that I would go back to, you know, we know we can add more machines. Like we reduced the number of machines we were, we were using. We'd probably be using five to 10,000 machines if we were on PHP. We would have to find another, we would, you know, going on this trajectory, we'd start adding more and more machines or bigger machines or scaling up a little more. Um, but we'd have to find some more technical innovation in what we do. And I, I believe we'd be able to find it. So it, it, that's the, you'd explore and you'd find what actually works. So for, uh, you mentioned ad personalization is one of the things you guys do. How do you think about offline versus uh, online algorithms given your low latency requirements? Yeah, I mean, we mostly think of offline. We mostly think if we want to do data science-like things, we do them in systems like Hadoop or like Spark or, you know, in Vertica or on people's other computation environments. And we bring those models into ways that they can be pre-stored and accessed very quickly. So there's a lot of offline computation. There's not as much. You know, you just don't have as much time to do serious, you know, querying about what this user really wants the instant you have to decide on bidding on an ad in one millisecond or five milliseconds or ten milliseconds. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned Vertica a number of times. Now, Vertica is uh, optimized for a read-only use case. It's not really for read-write. Right. So is your use case read-only, or you're comparing uh, these databases with Vertica? So our use case is read-write, and we know Vertica is optimized for read-only. But we, you know, I mean, my analogy is it's like a poodle with a hat holding a balloon standing on its hind legs. And we, we've, we've gone so far, we've been able to keep that thing standing upright. Now, it's kind of the magic of these guys over here. Um, but there's the option as well to say we were starting to get into more problems with that to pull back and go to another type of system. So that's why I buy into this kind of log-based architecture because then I could take the transactional things that I need to do, maybe put them in MariaDB or some or VoltDB or something else that comes along the line, right? Um, but so far we're not at that point. Um, do you think that from a working point of view, um, you're 
your architecture in terms of the software is going to require um, uh, fairly soon um, response times that have to be lower or you just have to have more capability in terms of volume of processing? Like, yeah. do you need to go like, uh, say, instead of 20 to 30 microsecond latencies on networking on internet to something like below one microsecond on infinite band or something like that? Or you just need to go from, say, one gigabit to 10 gigabit, 20 gigabit, 40 gigabit? Just, pro just right. bandwidth. So, right. so really the question breaks down to, you know, at, at every level, do we need to kind of scale up or scale out a little bit? Um, and you're talking about the networking side. Yeah, I, you know, every so often, Omer shows me switch vendors or, or Kali, another one of our network engineers. This is what the H HFT guys do for their switches, and they do crazy things, right? And they're expensive, and they're, you know, mi you know low microsecond. So from a, at a physical layer, it's not something I worry about a lot where we are. But from a competitive layer, yes, you will need to get faster. Um, meaning, I'm not saying, you know, I need to buy the latest, you know, switch that gives me, you know, 500 nanosecond, you know, time. But I do need to worry about everybody compressing down the time so that when we participate in this marketplace, what now looks like fast is slow in a year. But are you going to need to lower your response time um, from 50 milliseconds to, say, one millisecond eventually? Or you yeah. don't have to? Yes, I think you will. How long does that take? I don't know. But eventually, yeah. Uh, I have a follow-on question. One second. I have a follow-on question on this. So in your uh, hard knocks scale here, would you think uh, there would be another a uh, column which has network also mapping into these characteristics that you're monitoring? Because it seems like it's not just the database. A lot of other things are involved in yeah, it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's never just that. Um, it's not something I think about a lot. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, you hook up the hardware and you buy your switches and you get the networking you get and you get the bandwidth you get. Um, if the database, you know, some databases on this system are written in Java. Most are written in C++ or C. Um, there might be something in the basic level of the database that limits how fast it can deal with things, and that might be an issue. But in general, no. I, I don't really think, oh, how well does this database do with networking? I think, you know, can we buy a switch that connects 40 nodes in a cluster? Great. Let's put that there. I see. Can we do, can we limit a couple more questions so we can wrap yeah, up? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned switching from PHP to C++ for ad serving. So I'm curious, do you guys also leverage, um, and you have seven data centers around the world you're using, do you leverage commercial CDNs to get that very fast delivery of the actual assets, or do you actually serve the assets too? No, we've always done CDNs. So I have a fundamental question for you. I think performance definitely is uh, uh, one of the top tops on your agenda. And right now we have a com computational bot bottleneck storage bottleneck as well as networking bottleneck. Networking, you can use infinite band, things like that. It's very ex expensive. And storage, you can use SSD, direct, direct attached uh, storage, uh, flash-based or in-memory, whatever. So w among those three, what is the t biggest bottleneck y you see in your, in, in, in your day in day out application? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go with the Brian Bukowski world, <laughs> which is, when those 3D SSD chips that may allow me to buy terabytes of SSD that's super fast and put them in a couple boxes, that's going to be, I don't know if that's the bottleneck I need to eliminate, but that's going to be a real game-changing event. Um, and I think that's going to be for our industry and a lot of things. So when you know, there is this kind of massive increase in fast storage, I, I really don't think people are going to go and get you know, petabytes of memory in the next five years. But they are going to get petabytes of storage that's fast in flash or, or SSDs or whatever. So that's, to me, if you ask me what's the most exciting potential new thing, that's probably the one. All right. John, thank you very much. This was extremely informational.